Welcome to the HMO Property Show by investors for investors. Brought to you by the HMO Property Co., Australia's leaders in impact investing. Investments made with the intention to generate a measurable, beneficial social or environmental impact alongside a positive financial return. Catch us weekly as we discuss all things cash flow positive property investing. Welcome back to the HMO Property Show. Today I've got another one of my good friends. It's Dr. Angad Singh. Angad, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, mate. It's a pleasure to be here. It's very rare that I call you doctor, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not a doctor anymore. Right. So my registration's expired. So I think I've got to change that 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 branding, you know. Oh, change man. the Instagram title. <laughs> it's a shame. Mm. What what took you away from because you were a dentist before you got into construction, weren't you? Yeah. What yeah. what made you transition from dentistry into the building game? Yeah, look, it was I was cold and I I just loved property um from as long as I can remember. I started developing real estate pretty much my first started reading about it. I think I bought my first site a couple of years out of uni, made every mistake you can imagine, <laughs> but through the uh through the journey fell in love. You know, eventually started a construction company, and then that started to pull me away. And uh, yeah, it's a you know, I did dentistry for about ten years, uh, and a couple of years ago um, gave it up. Yeah, you know, so to go f- full into this uh, property thing, it's a big step. Like dentistry, is seen as one of them, um, one of them is it a trade? Is it? It's a. It's a. Mm. It's one of them specialist areas that someone would desire to be, and a lot of people would yeah. never think they could be a dentist because yeah. it's so specialized. Yeah, and then there you are stepping away from it to, to get into the construction game. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's um, there's a very high barrier for entry, mm. and it's a it's a unique combination of technical, hands on, science, uh, you know, academics, like all, all of that stuff, which which makes it quite difficult to get into. Mm. Uh, but you know, it's like with everything, you, you do what you do and then you should kind of follow your heart at the end of the day, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad you did because uh, that's how our bromance was formed, wasn't it? It was, man. Over it real was. estate yeah. and property. Yeah, you were actually one of my very first, uh, when I started doing seminars, you were one of the first people that, that came to that, yeah. you know, um, and that's really how it all started, which, you know, you really catapulted us in a, in a big way, so. That was like 2015, 16, I think, uh, yeah, maybe 17. Been, I think it must have been 2017. Yeah, yeah. 2017, 2018, something yeah. like that. And uh, do you know, I think the the biggest challenge we're going to have today, mate, on this podcast is yeah. keeping this within like forty five minutes to an hour because sure. me and you go on Monday uh, Sunday morning walks sometimes yeah. for two hours long, yeah. and we get to the end of them two hours and we've still got stuff to talk about. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and obviously, you know, we talk, you know, at least a couple of times a week, so we have to make sure that we don't go into tangents without giving people the context exactly of, of what we're speaking about. <laughs> well, look, mate, a lot of people are still reaching out to me now. Um, you're a builder, yeah in the trenches you know exactly mm. what's going on what, what's the building industry like right now and mm. the, the day to day we're at the back in the jan- uh, July yeah. 2023 yeah so are we see is a light at the end of the tunnel is yeah. it is it getting back to normal or are we yeah. still in an absolute pickle mate we are I would say that we are way way better than we were six to twelve months ago mm. um, what we're seeing is we're seeing some labor availability come back and as a result of that we're starting to see some of the projects move forward uh, at, at almost normal normal rates, right? We're not seeing a lot of delays on the simple projects. What we're finding is the trades are prioritizing straightforward, easy jobs, right? So what we're finding is that the simple single story uh, builds, they're just, they're flying through, like, mm. like nothing's happening, right? Yeah. Two story stuff is still a problem. We're finding a lot of challenges with, you know, carpenters and other things that don't necessarily want to do two story work because it's, for them potentially, maybe the hourly rate's not there or something like that. So we are, I'd say we're over the hump. For builders in particular, um, we obviously, we just had another big builder in Perth go under last week. You might have heard of that. Uh, Modco, obviously, you know, we both are acquainted with the directors there, um, which is very sad for them. Mm. And quite likely we'll see a few more. Um, a lot of builders, I think, have been running on fumes, on, on vapour up until now. And what the problem now will be is what do you do after the demand has dried up, you know, the grants bought three years of demand kind of forward mm. and we're likely to go into something where there's not a great deal of demand. So the challenge has changed for builders. Before it was about how do I manage drinking from the fire hose and now there's no more water. So you mm-hmm. have to um, 
the, the problem shifted. Yeah. yeah, so the pipeline is no longer as strong as it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, for us, like, we're a small to medium-sized builder, right? And we do a lot of our in-house stuff and a lot of repeat clients and things like that. So we're not affected that much by the volatility. Mm. Uh, definitely, we were affected by the cost increases. I think everybody was. Yeah. Um, and we were, we were definitely slowed down a lot by the trade and materials and suppliers and all the rest of that. But, you know, I really believe that we're, we're on the other side of it now. So, yeah, onwards and upwards from here. So should people still be, have concerns about building now or do you think the concern should be moving towards opportunity? Yeah. Or Look, seeing opportunity? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> that's a really good question. I think you should, if you understand building, you're always paranoid. Right? You're always <laughs> paranoid because there's so much that can go wrong. There's so many things you have to worry about. There's so many things that have to go right for it to work, right? Um, so I think that, it's not a time that you can go in blindly and foolishly and sign a building contract with anyone and expect everything's going to be okay. Um, although I don't think that was ever the time. Some people got lucky. I think now for the smart operators, good developers, sophisticated, you know, I think if they've got a great opportunity, they should be able to find a builder to make it work. Mm. And, and they shouldn't um, overvalue that risk anymore mm. yeah, obviously like I said earlier I mean you've gone long walks we talk about a lot of things on, mm. on them walks and, and it was you know it was great to see how you navigated yourself and your company through mm. the, the issues that you were coming up against because obviously we we bring the, oh, we mate. bring our problems to the walk story, yeah, yeah. so we're uh, talking. I've come up against this problem, and we kind of yeah. solved it between us. And then you were talking about how you were navigating your way through, mate. And look, yeah. it hasn't been easy. Oh man, uh, there was that's been therapy, you know, <laughs> like, tru truly. Um, you know, it's, we're very lucky to have a relationship where we can be very transparent with each other, um, and we're both growing businesses at the same time, so we run up into similar problems. But man, it was tough, and, and you know, I got to say thank you for being there for me. I don't know how I would have gone without a good friend, you. Know? <laughs> I remember as well when I first got into property and I was all in on the HMO and uh, you were like, have you seen this SDA thing? Like, yeah. This has just come out. Yeah. And I, I kind of just went deep into HMO territory and yeah. that's been our core business for quite a while. Mm. But we are sort of teetering with a little bit of SDA stuff at the minute. Not a great deal, but um, we are helping our investors with it and we're setting the property management business up to manage it as well so we can be end-to-end -end provider. Yeah. But whilst I went down that avenue, you kind of went into the SDA avenue, didn't you? Yeah. And you went into that. So it'd be good to have a little bit of a chat about the SDA today, what it's like building them. Sure. Any issues that are popping up, the changes that have happened, because it's yep. a bit of a hot topic at the minute, isn't it? It is, it is, and um, and it seems like there's a fair bit of demand coming through, mm. or supply coming through, I should say. Uh, well, certainly, we're getting a lot of inquiry for people that want to build SDA. Mm. We're seeing a lot of house and land packages being sold, um, and for sure, you know, it's it's similar to a residential house, but it's not. A residential house, and there are challenges. Mm. Um, so yeah, happy to happy to go down that <laughs> rabbit hole as far as you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, like like I say, the, the yeah. tricky bit's going to tr keeping it within the barrier at the time yeah. layer, isn't it? So SDA, when you said earlier as well, that there's a lot of supply coming through, and mm. you said you know when your taxi driver starts talking about a certain yeah, investment man. type, you should yeah. probably get out of it. Yeah, it <laughs> it last night your it taxi last driver. Last night, my Uber drivers. <laughs> Telling me that he's thinking about investing in SDA and he's asking me about it. And I'm, you know, obviously I didn't even know the guy. Somehow we got onto the topic and, and I was literally thinking to myself, I'm like, uh oh, this is the moment, right? This is the red flag. This is the red flag. <laughs> yeah. So with, with the amount of supply coming through at the minute, and there's a lot of eyeballs on this. It's government funded or government backed to yeah. a certain degree. Yeah. Um, it's got to be built to a certain specification. So if it's built right, the returns are quite lucrative and then yeah. the added benefit is you're getting to house people in yeah. suitable accommodation. Is the supply that's coming through now, should it be a concern? Is there enough demand out there to meet the supply that you think's going through? Yeah, I don't I don't think um, I don't think we should think of it as like one homogenous big market with supply and demand, right? Because not every SDA is the same. There's significant differences between different types of SDA, different mm. qualities, different everything. Um, not all participants are the same. And so I, I don't think the macro broader market is necessarily a reflection on whether a particular product or location will do well. I think that's got more to do with, you know, the general best practice of development, location, design, quality, uh, and actually in this case, the provider. Um, this really, really hinges upon the care provider and the SDA provider having, you know, a high quality service that they deliver to their, to effectively their clients, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not super worried about the demand, uh, oh, sorry, the supply that's coming through um, 
in the main because I'm sure you've seen some of it. Um, a lot of it's not great. Mm. Um, even recently, there's been a big push towards the improved ability, which I think is, in principle, a good thing. But what people are also doing is that they are effectively, what they're doing is they're playing like a spreadsheet game and they're trying to build the cheapest product with the highest return and they, <laughs> and they think that'll work. And, yeah. you know, you've been in property for a decade. I've been in property for more than a decade now. And it's this, like, you just realise a spreadsheet doesn't mean anything. Mm. Yeah, if you, if you don't have confidence in a product in and of itself, it doesn't really matter what the margin is or what the returns might be. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, there's a lot of people that are very... Um, have you heard the expression, lust and greed are more gullible than innocence? <laughs> yeah. A lot of, a lot of yeah. gullible, like a lot of, a lot of people are spruiking this as well, yeah. you know? So, yeah. so I'm not super worried about the market overall. I think as long as people are focused on the good quality products and they're partnering with good providers, I think there's still plenty of opportunity mm. in the space. I think some of the benefits we've had as well as being in WA, it didn't get rolled out here until just recently so yeah. we, we've been uh, sat there like the, the Michael Jackson gif eating the popcorn yeah. watching what's going on on the east coast and yes. seeing the the mistakes that they've been making but also the good things that they've been sure. doing as well and we've had the opportunity to kind of look at that and take what we needed to take and then deliver what we need to deliver yeah. so when you said there the, the spreadsheet exercise yes the four bed four bath um, yep. high physical support yeah. um, looks like it's going to make Thousands and thousands of dollars in cash flow. Yep. Um, but the reality is, even the valuers are devaluing them properties Correct. because of the vacancy rate that they've seen on the East Coast Correct. as well. So yep. just necessarily because it's got the potential to house four people yep. doesn't mean that you're going to get them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's actually it. I, I sometimes look at the East Coast, I often look at the East Coast and worry that we're making all the same mistakes that they made because we're just, uh, we're just not thinking uh, about what they did. You know what I mean? And we're certainly seeing a lot of, um, you know, in Queensland, there's all these stories about like a street that's got like 17 SDA properties and they're all sitting vacant. Mm. And the reason is because it was, in a, it was a cheap land. People built the same type of product, low cost, not particularly desirable. And that's what happened, right? Um, so, it was the same builder as well, wasn't it? It might have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, I think it was the same builder yeah. that went and, out and built them all. And, and, that's what, and that's what you realize, you know, like um, I think the big lesson from the East Coast is to focus on where the people want to live, what they want to live in, and make sure that you're partnered with good businesses that can also provide the care and the, the property management. Mm. You know? So how do, we, how do we find out where they want to live? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, to be honest, I don't trust the macro data at all. I find the data on the NDIA's website it's is... It's skewed, isn't it? It's, it's completely sketchy. Um, I mean, we know anecdotally, like between us and a few of our friends, like we're probably 80% of the market, right? <laughs> yeah. So... Like, we know for a fact it's wrong. <laughs> like, it's, it's 100% wrong what they're proposing. Um, so how do you, how do you I get, guess, get good information when the macro data is just all over the place? Mm. Um, but I think, I think you have to not be so worried about the macro data and start thinking about it like a small business in a small location. And it's about, well, can I get a provider who's got some participants, they may have two or three that are suitable for this particular location or or a cohort, right? And design with that type of mindset. Because you don't need 100 people, you just need two. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it's quite easy to get two if uh, you've got a good product and a good provider and everything else. So I think that's, that's how I do it, or that's how we do it. We certainly, we lean very heavily on the providers and we actually uh, do it, backwards like we'll speak to a provider and try to get an understanding of their typical participant um, archetype you would say mm -hmm. um, location wise and all those other things that that matter and then design to that and basically ask them to come in with us early mm -hmm. um, sometimes either under a head lease or even under a property management agreement whatever the case may be but really having some skin in the game up front so that they're involved you know yeah yeah, yeah. and th there's obviously a standard or the, the minimum sort of specification we can build the SDAs to. Is it NDIS 1.1 or is that yeah. the standard? Yeah, um, yeah, the design guide, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but we can over-spec these as well. So if, you, if you're concerned about yeah. um, saturation in the market, then yeah. spend a little bit more money, build a Have better the product than everybody yeah, else. I think that's wise. And then you're going to minimize your, your vacancy as well, aren't you? Yeah, yeah I think that's wise. And, and remember, um, I'm not sure... We don't know exactly yet uh, what what quality means to a participant. We don't we don't quite understand that, right? We 
we won't understand that until we've done this for a few more years, I think. So is it bigger bedrooms or is it a second living area? Is it a private courtyard or is it a TV in their room? Is it um, a better care provider or is it a place that their family can come and hang out? Mm. Is it more community activities or is it more privacy? We don't know yet, right? So we don't know what good is. Uh, we're learning as we go and I, hopefully we learn quickly. Um, but what you can definitely guarantee is that some of the stuff that's being built where the focus is primarily on hitting a budget price point, uh, that, that will struggle, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And um, we do the same with our HMOs as well. Yeah. When you think about it, anyone can go out and build a six bed, six bath house. Yes. But building it to a certain specification so that you know when the market is yeah. saturated to a certain degree, yeah. you're going to stand out from everybody else. And you mentioned, you said it yeah. act like a small business. Yeah. If you're a small business, what do you do to beat the competition? That's it. You try and stand out from yeah. the rest, right? Yeah. Yeah, and what you can guarantee is that some houses are going to get filled. We just have to be one of those. And um, on that point, by the way, like what you guys do, and you know, I've known you since, I guess, pre-HMO, right? Yeah. So seeing you develop this HMO, that's what I've seen. I've seen you improve your designs. I've seen you recognize that people really want to have bigger rooms, smaller living areas, having more privacy within their bedrooms, having kitchenettes in their bedrooms, like having the furniture packs you've developed and, and iterated several times. That's the type of journey we need to go on with SDA yeah. as well. You know, really learning what is it that that the market wants. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And we've, like, when we started that journey, we obviously didn't have access to that data. Yeah. Um, but, like, you also said between me, you, and probably three or four of the people, we are yeah. bringing probably 80% of the SCS yeah. up to the market. So we, we, yeah, exactly. We're probably right. going to work it out between us sooner <laughs> sure. or later. And we, we've got our first one. It's the end of July now. We've got our first uh, HPS properties getting handed over. Nice. Uh, hitting PCI, sorry, at the end of August. So okay. So probably four or five weeks away. Oh, fantastic, um, man. Yeah. So fantastic. they've already got tenancy lined up as well. Great. So we'll start getting some feedback from them and, yeah. And, yeah, and that's it. Collecting some data. Yeah, and you guys were really good. I think, I mean, you guys, I think, had the right focus because you understood that this is a quality product. You understood that the yields are great. You don't need to cheap out put in the extra stuff, put in the nicer stuff. You partnered early with a care provider or a disability, an SDA provider. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that was like, that's a really great model. Uh, if anyone who's listening wants to get into the space, uh, you'd be a good, you know, <laughs> a good role model for that. <laughs> um, there's, there's been a few changes in the space just recently as well, hasn't there? Which has probably attracted more people. Yeah. Anyone that was probably sitting on the fence now has jumped Jump off that off. fence. Yeah, well and truly. Yeah. yeah. So what are the changes been? So... Essentially, uh, you're talking about the price guide, the it, price review. Yeah, yeah. So, for for some context, I guess uh, the SDA funding is determined through a price review process, and they do that every five years. And this was the first one that they've done. So, what they have effectively done is they've had another look at what the funding levels they had uh, provided for SDA funding, and um, looked at their assumptions around certain things and tweaked some numbers to come up with a new, I guess, a funding schedule, right? And the effect of that is that, you know, our flagship products, and I think yours is the same, which is a two-participant home, uh, HPS has just gone through the roof in terms of its income. Mm. Um, not only has it gone through the roof in terms of its income, the big risk of a, of a HPS home is that you might not get a HPS participant, right? So you have to factor in, well, what if I only get an IL or maybe even two ILs in this home? And before, a two-participant IO home was probably getting around 65000 bucks of income. Um, it's still good. Which is not, not, not terrible, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, if you talk to anyone in the residential space, this is amazing. Right? Yeah. This, is, this is the best thing they've ever heard. But now that home is getting around 160000 yeah. of IO. So I think the big change is, number one, it's massively increased the, 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 the top line for everything. But it's also significantly increased the floor. So it's de-risked the SDA sector significantly. Mm. And as a result of that, many people are jumping in. Um, because the IL funding has gone up, a lot of people have now started developing strategies just to do a like an IL specialized product. IL, by the way, means improved livability, um, if people haven't heard that term before. And the requirements for that build are significantly lower than for a HPS build, right? Yep. And so there's a strong push to trying to create really affordable house and land packages, which are really investor-led, uh, to, to, to hit this IL market now. Mm -hmm. Where are the problems with that, though? Um, 
Look, there will be some problems. I, I don't know if you remember, about maybe like two years ago, I talked to you about IL product. Because mm. the data was showing we needed more IL. We needed more IL. So we yeah. actually, we've been doing IL for a while. Um, and funny, our IELs actually look a lot like HMOs because they're, they're quite big rooms. I, have you seen our? I think you might have seen our yeah, plans. I think I have. So I'm, I'm not, in principle, I'm not, I, I'm not against IL. I think it's a great product, right? Uh, the problem is um, with IL. With, with disabilities, anecdotally, I don't have a statistic around this, but what I'm told from the care providers I work with, around 60% of disabilities are degenerative. They'll get worse over time. So it's fully anticipated that someone who is IL today will turn into FA and maybe even HPS. Hmm. Right? So it's expected that it's degenerative. So you, I think that that will become a significant um, selection criteria for someone who is looking for a long-term residence. Mm. You know, will I be able to stay here as my MS gets worse or as my Huntington's degenerates or whatever the case may be? Um, I think that, I think that designing purely IO product at the lowest price point possible will, might look really great on a spreadsheet, but I really worry about that type of product. That's actually where I'm seeing a lot of the, the supply come through. And that's what I'm most concerned, yeah. mm, or I would be if so, I was in that space. But. So, so now the IL um, income has been increased, so people are starting to flood the market. Not all flood the market, but bring more yeah. IL product to the market. Yeah. But they're bringing it in at its lowest possible value. Yeah. Or the cheapest yeah. builder can probably do it. Yeah, the minimum that's standard. what we're seeing. Yeah. yeah. So when we go back to the, about 20 minutes ago, when we yeah. were saying make sure that you build better than everybody else, because yeah. in a way you're kind of future-proofing your investment, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, there's another like maybe a mis a mistake in the understanding of people. So they look at the SDA funding schedule and they think that the NDI, the NDIA is like some, you know, all knowing, all understanding, genius organization that is uh, guiding the market as to what it needs. Right? That's absolutely not the case. Right? It re- if you read any of these reports, you realize that they don't know anything. No one knows anything yet about this space. It's too young. We don't know. Mm. Right. The way that um, the way that the SDA funding, the way that the NDI comes to a funding schedule, is essentially through a cost analysis for dwellings. So they say, how much does this thing cost to build? How much would the land be? And they come up with a model of you know essentially a formula to say, okay, for a two participant IL home, it's X amount of dollars, right? And they want their their ideal scenario is that every category in any location would achieve the same benchmark return. Right? That's what they're trying to do. And what has happened, interesting with the price review, there has been some funding that's come down, right? And it's come down on the basis that they believe that their previous assumptions about the construction costs were too high for that mm. type of dwelling. So, so it has a, gone backwards. That was apartments, right? That was apartments, yep. right? Now, what you have to be careful about is I really think they've overshot some of the cost assumptions on IL products. And so I am worried that once they realize that, they'll come back. Mm. Right, I think they've really undershot the cost assumptions on robust products, so I suspect that in the future you'll see a big jump in robust. Yep, um, and I think HPS is about where it should be. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, but there is absolutely nothing about that data that is trying to tell you as an investor what to do. Uh, if you think that they're trying to guide you, um, you you haven't read their formula. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you yeah. should read it and uh, and don't believe it. Yeah, yeah, but it is confusing because when the old pricing review came or the old pricing guideline, it, yeah. it, it, it's it basically said we if you build two bedroom two bathroom apartments with an OA, yeah, we'll pay the highest rent. So everyone yeah. started going out and building yeah. apartments. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't the case. Was yeah. it? <laughs> well, what happened was no one got the participants didn't get funding for that product. Mm. So, so this is this is exactly the point. That is not a signal. It, do not think of it as a signal, yeah. right? It's kind of like saying, okay, well, you could build this amazing product, but you, your chance of vacancy is like 90%. That doesn't make it a good deal, mm. right? You have to factor in the risks. Uh, that's where people are missing. I think that's where people are going wrong with SDA. They're just not considering risk at all. Mm. And the, the funding schedule does not price in risk. They do not look at your location, whether you're in a new estate on a street with 15 other SDAs versus an infill location, that's got a much higher value for land, much more expensive build, but might have the same income. And you as a developer have to make a decision, which one do I want? Uh, and I can tell you what 99% of people will do, they take the cheaper product with a higher income, right? <laughs> Probably at their peril. <laughs> so, so, but this is, this is the unfortunate truth of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we, you mentioned the robust product there as well. Yeah. The, 
I don't know. And like you said, like between our network, we're, we're pumping out quite yeah. a lot of SDA product. I don't know anybody that's doing any robust stuff at the minute, yeah. do you? Uh, other than us, no. Right. Yeah. How, um, what, how With the robust, how are you finding out what the needs are for the participant? Have you got a participant lined up that you're designed specifically for? Good question, man. So robust is tough, right? Robust is definitely the hardest of all the categories to mm-hmm. understand from a construction point of view uh, because the diversity of needs in the robust category are enormous, really, really wide ranging. So, and it's obviously as a developer, it's too much risk to design around a person. So whilst that might be a great ideology from the NDIS to say, okay, have a person and design a house for them. What if that person leaves? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm stuffed, right? So, um, what we are doing with our robust product is is right now my understanding of the demand for robust is is, is enormous, um, and there's lots and lots of people who have robust SDA funding that are in really inappropriate accommodation at the moment. So the way that we basically uh, design our our robust product is that we work with the provider who who usually um, services these people, and we get guidance from them in terms of locations and design style. What I have learnt through this journey is that anywhere is is pretty much okay for robust at the moment. But the only viable robust typology is a single participant villa. Mm. They will never put in more than one person into a home. It's just too dangerous. Mm. And so and there's no category for a single person house, which is kind of weird. So the only thing that they will consider is a single person villa and beyond that, beggars can't be choosers, right? Um, they do have some other like nuanced require like requirements. Like for example they want an OOA, but they want the OOA to have a, like an exit so that someone can just lock the OOA and just leave if they need mm, to. Yep. Um, they do want to have uh, a few houses close by so that if there's some issue in one that you can call support. So there's like some nuanced requirements like that, but yep. nothing that, I mean, you could figure that stuff out in a 20-minute conversation with the provider. That's not the hard part. Yeah. Right? So with the with the robust design and pricing, and you say there's there's no category there for single bedroom. Mm. So what are you building two bedroom? Uh, single, just, single participant villas. Yeah. For so, villas, there's a single person, right. but not for houses. Right. So yeah. single single villa with on site assistance. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That seems to be the model. Yeah. Cool. And what's the sort of footprint size on them? They? They're small, man. Um, so you could build them on 150 to 220 square meters of land, yeah. and the house would probably land at about. 100 to 160 ish yeah. yeah so it's still pretty big so yeah i mean that we so we just build them as big as the as we're allowed right yeah if yeah. you told me what's the smallest i can build it i could probably build it in 70 square meters, <laughs> yeah right? which is a single bedroom um, dwelling granny flat. yeah yeah you could for yeah. sure i mean exactly yeah. exactly it's a single bedroom dwelling because the always still quite small and remember people don't sleep there they yeah. always isn't designed for sleeping yeah. it's an active care so there's always someone awake and so they don't even want a bed in the eye they just don't that they, they don't want that mm. right um we, we still like to provide a breakout room in the villas. Uh, and you can't, there's no added benefit of a, vill, of a breakout room in a single participant villa. In fact, it's not a, you don't get the benefit for it. Mm-hmm. But the providers still seem to think it's nice. And if someone's having an episode and you want to take them out of a, like a stimulating environment, you put them into a room with, without a lot of stimulus that's quite plain and simple, then that can be helpful. So we're still designing. Think of them as like, Small three bedroom, two bathroom homes, like really small three yeah, by twos. That's that's probably a good model. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah with a single car. 160. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah like a small triplex. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Balga sort of triplex. They're actually perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah for for this for this uh, this particular provider. Yeah. yeah. So if you had a, a 720 square meter block, oh, man, I'll take it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll build three with a provider. It's yeah. it's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. The returns aren't great, to be honest. Um, at least not at the moment. They're not as good as IL or HBS or anything like that. Um, but I believe there's a lot lower risk and I believe that that income will increase a lot. So going back to the pricing review that just came out there, yeah. and you said Robust probably hasn't got the increase that it should have had mm-hmm. and IL could potentially come back down in the future. Mm-hmm. Is that is there a risk in there for the investor? With um, if they get an IL participant in there and their funding gets reduced, yeah, absolutely. So their their interest, their interest, their rent can come yeah. down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, let me let me be clear about this. Right. So how, if you read the pricing review, they will talk about their methodology, and you should pay very close attention to how they, how they think, because what they, it's not important just to know the number today. 
you also need to understand how they came up with that number so that you can predict what the number would do next, right? Now, one of the key assumptions on all of the numbers, so the biggest cost is construction, and they've assumed it's a class three construction. We know that that may not stay that way. So you fully expect if they do change that construction requirement from a class three to a class one, in that scenario, you would expect all of the construction cost to decrease, right? Uh, which in turn should lead to a reduction in the return, yeah. right? Um, what's interesting with the robust thing is that robust and IL is the same price to build, which is I can guarantee is not the case. Uh, and the maintenance cost on robust and IL is the same, which I can also guarantee is not the case, yeah, yeah. right? Mm. So what's happened, at least my reading of it, this price review was supposed to be out in December last year, and it got pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, got released like two weeks before the 1st of July, which is when it was implemented, right? So they ran out of time. Uh, it's very clear that they, they, they rushed and <laughs> ran out of time. And they did make some specific comments in there about having a limited review in the future to look at issues which weren't addressed, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and my reading between the lines is what they've done is they said robust is too hard, it's too weird, it's too different, we don't know how to price the maintenance because it's, it's strange. We don't even know how to think about the categories because there's no such thing as a three participant robust house. You shouldn't that shouldn't even exist. Um, so what do we do? Let's just put it let's just put it aside. We won't touch it too much, and then we'll just focus on everything else and we'll deal with robust as a separate thing. And I suspect that'll happen over the next one or two years. Mm, interesting. Yeah. interesting. And it, and I think robust should be funded at least at the same level as HPS, if not more. Yeah. yeah. I do too, yeah, when you look at the specifics of it. Yeah. Um uh, apart from the pricing guideline as well, we've also got that the base, um, what's it called, the base rate sort yes, of yeah. spreadsheet calculator yeah, yeah. Uh, factor. Yeah, um, the so location factor you Location mean? factor, that's yeah. the one. Couldn't yeah. get it out there. Yeah. Just had a coffee, but my brain still hasn't woken up properly yet. Um, so the location factor as well, that, that would, you would think that that would tell you where they were more product uh, putting. Yeah. Looking you, at that, looking at that calculator. Yeah, you think it's, just, it's not, it's not a signal. So, well, let me let me put it this way, right? Um, why is why is let's call it the southeast? Let's call it like um, Armadale, Gosnells, etc. Why does that get more location factor than June Dana? Makes zero sense, right? Mm -hmm. So what they do is they take an SA four area, which is a very large statistical area, by the way. And they take a median price of land, and you you everyone knows the problems with medians, right? And then they say, okay, if that's the median price, then per square meter, so that will be our land allowance, right? And then they adjust accordingly. <laughs> now, that's why the southeast location factor is higher than the northeast, right? But, but it's completely wacky. <laughs> but if you look at the overall area, if you go like, let's say you go 10 k's northeast, you land up in Balga and Westminster and, and that kind of Nolamara and that kind of pocket, right? Which is quite affordable. Mm. You go 10 k's southeast, you're in like Como, Apple Cross, Kensington. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. Like that is expensive, bro. <laughs> so, so yes, if you take a broad, like a statistical area that big and you look at a median, then yeah, it makes sense that southeast should be 1.09 and um, I think northeast is 9.94 or whatever the numbers are. But uh, if you look at Jundana and then you look at like, um, I don't know, just pick a suburb in like Camilla or something. Yeah. It's, there's no way. There's no way that that should get the location factors that it does. Yeah. Right? It's, it's too blunt of an instrument. Um, and frankly, it's just not a signal for demand. It just isn't. Right. Yeah. So I, I pretty much ignore the location factor. <laughs> so essentially the full document is just confusing. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's understand what they're trying to do, right? Like I said, if they had a crystal ball and perfect knowledge, then you would get the same return no matter where you built, no matter mm. what you built. That's what they're trying to do, right? They want you to have that 12, whatever the way to count, I think it's like 12% or something. That's what you should get as a return, mm. right? But the fact that you're seeing that IL as being major returns is because they've made mistakes in the cost assumptions. The fact that you saw two-bedroom HPS apartments were getting these massive yields was because they made a mistake in the cost assumptions. Now, you can be greedy and you can think that you're the smartest person in the world, uh, because you know how to reduce the cost on this and build it in a certain way and, and whatever. But the reality is they will catch up. Uh, they will figure this out. They will correct this somehow. Um, so you should try to play the more long game. Mm. Um, and the the price guide is important for sure because that's how you define your feasibility. But it shouldn't be the only thing you look at. When you assess a deal, 
You should look at all of the factors about that deal. Who are the providers in place? What is the product like? What is my long-term risk going to be? What is my chance of vacancy here? That's your number one thing is actually mm. vacancy, yeah, right? 100%. You get all those things right, um, and there's a 11% return instead of a 13 No problem. Happy I'm not news. worried at all, yeah. right? Um, I would rather take a deal that's, in my view, better overall with a lower margin than something that's showing me an 18%, but I just have no confidence in the in the product, you know? Mm. Yeah. Well, like you said, that's just a spreadsheet exercise. That's just a spreadsheet, it, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, ultimately, you got to make the deal work. <laughs> yeah. uh, you touched on earlier as well, uh, difference between class one and class three and the price guidelines have been factored as if they get built as class three. There's, yeah. there's a little bit of confusion around that mm-hmm. at the minute, isn't there? Because in there as well, they're also talking about fire sprinklers, yeah. which should be a class three building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. then you can still put the fire sprinklers in a class one building. Yeah, and so the class is class one, and we've had some conversations. About yeah, this. for sure. I've heard sure. you on other podcasts talking yeah. about this as well. So, yeah, what, what are we building? Is it class one? Is it class three? What what is it? Man, it's a, okay. Let's let's understand what's going on here, right? So this is confusing. I don't know why it's confusing. To me, it's not that. I feel like it's quite clear, but it's that what you get from the NTC doesn't make sense. Mm. So, in the NTC, there's. Uh, maybe again just for context right so the ncc is the national construction code what it does is it's it's essentially our law for how you need to build things right so what it does is it takes every single type of building that you can imagine from this office to a granny flat to a shed to every single type and it tries to split them into 10 categories only 10 right? you, there's hundreds of different types of buildings but we can only think about 10 because you can't think about 100 right mm. so what it looks at is class one buildings are generally houses they're residential accommodation and they provide, you know, that's what that's what they're about, right? Class three is generally residential accommodation, but when you have multiple unrelated parties that are going to live there, okay? So that's where we are at the moment. Now, what happened in your space, the HMO space, right? Because by that definition, HMO should be class three, right? <laughs> yeah. It's about risk, right? So the NCC, it's, again, it's not like some godly document that's never intended to be modified and is never wrong. Uh, they recognise that when you have multiple unrelated people, if you have a boarding house with 25 people in it, that's like three storeys high and all the rest, that's quite different to a HMO with five people, right? So the NTC started to recognise that, hang on a second, this share house typology, which is coming up, is, is, is technically a class group, but shouldn't be. So let's move it over to class 1B. So they created a new category to acknowledge that there's something different about a HMO for four or five people, um, it's it's not a class 1A now, but it's not a class 3. So let's create this subcategory called class 1B. Mm. And then it's got some additional requirements, but not all the requirements of class 3, right? The way the NCC reads today, um, there is a subcategory of class 3 called a residential care building. A residential care building is when more than 10% of the occupants require assistance with daily activities or would need assistance in evacuation in case of an emergency. Um, that might not be the exact definition, but something mm, like that. Yeah. Right? Every single SDA would meet that <laughs> like criteria. right? So it's not just a class three, it's actually a class three resi care, which is the highest form of class three. A class three resi care requires fire sprinklers as of, as of right. There's no option to do a class three without fire sprinklers. Mm, right? yeah. So... The current NCC, my view, is that the only the, 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 the way it's written is SDAs are residential class three residential care buildings that require fire sprinklers and all of the other things that come with that, right? However, uh, is the risk the same as if it was a 25-person hospital? I don't know, right? <laughs> it's clearly not. Uh, notwithstanding that, that's the way it's written today. Now it looks like the ABCB, which is the Australian Building Codes Board, has now finally started taking this issue seriously. And they are putting forward, uh, and they're reviewing it currently, right? And it looks like they will do the same thing that they did with Class 1B. And they may either have a Class 1C now, which is like a resi care building but smaller, or maybe even a Class 3B, which is like a resi care building but SDA. more like a house, right? So so very likely they'll, they'll, they'll bring to the party a new dwelling classification to fit this type of product. Um, and, and if they do that, then obviously we'll get a lot more clarity as to what to do. Mm. I think the reason the pricing review took the position that it's a class three is because it would be the most expensive way to build a house. And again, the logical path is that it, like if you read the NCC plainly, that's what it says. And I don't think you can really form a view uh, to the letter that's alternative to that. Mm. Um, but I fully understand the, the logical arguments like, come on, mate, it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not clearly not a, you know, 
hospital. Yeah. Right. So in your experience and the knowledge that you've got around this now, <clears throat> is there anything that we can do to kind of safeguard or future proof an mm-hmm. SDA build? Mm-hmm. Um, because with the HMOs in Western Australia, we can have yeah. up to 600 related people. So we don't technically need to be class 1B, yeah. but we do the installation of a class 1B fire yes. safety upgrade anyway. Yes. So is there something we can do in an SDA yeah. that you potentially and we're not saying this is definitely going to happen this is the foresight but yeah. is there something that you see happening that we can do to safeguard yeah so i'm i'm building class three yeah right uh, even though what i've just said is likely there'll be some um considerations yeah actually the big cost the big cost items in class three are actually around fire safety so number one is the sprinklers then you need your uh, defense monitoring then you need your upgraded smoke detection system and they're your big ticket items so I think that if they do do a class 1C, they'll include the big ticket items anyway. Yeah. So we are actually still doing class 3. Yeah. So And that's that's my I, position. stamped as class 3. Stamped as class right, 3. Right, okay. Yeah. But there's no, like, what's the difference after that? Once you put in the the fire, the, the fire is probably like 100 grand, right? And 80 grand or something. The big sprinklers and the um, the smoke detectors and everything. Once you add it all, it's about 80 grand. Mm. Uh, that's, that's the biggest... That's the biggest cost item. Yeah. After that, there's not much else to a Class 3, right? There is some consideration around the acoustics. So we use acoustic lining throughout the um, throughout all the participant rooms, which is not a requirement of the SDA. However, having said that, it's, to me, good practice anyway. So And it's not that expensive, so we'd probably do it even if we didn't have to. Even in your ILs? Yeah, we, yeah even yeah. in our ILs, yeah. yeah. Um, there, there is, again, when you, with a Class 3, one of the... Um, when you have a what they have in the NCC, they have these things called sole occupancy units or SOUs. Yeah. Right. Now, how you form a view on what is an SOU in an SDA <laughs> is another matter. Right. So, if you form a view that every single room is an SOU, then it becomes very tedious to do a class three and pro- pro- maybe impossible. You would need like, um, you know, you'd need like double cavity. You need like cavity acoustic <laughs> brick walls with, with no wall ties with 13 mils around each side just to achieve the acoustic. It'd be, it'd be wacky. Yeah. And that would need to extend through the roof. So it'd be which, like a class two, class three hybrid. Yeah, well, it, that's a, I mean, that's a requirement of a class three. It's also the yeah. requirement of a class two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the requirement of anywhere, actually, where you have uh, sole occupancy units that are, that are, that are, that are there. But um, clearly, this is not an apartment, right? Like, clearly, the room is not designed to be the same amenity as an apartment from mm. So I suspect that's what they'll relax. But if you take the position that the whole building is one occupancy unit operated by one care provider with multiple like shared people who are not, they're unrelated in a sense, but at the same time you expect that they know each other. It's not like a hotel where someone's there today is a different person tomorrow, right? It's like a share house, more yeah. like a share house. Yeah, yeah. So I suspect the part that they'll relax is around what, what is an SOU. Um, and if they do that, then then it's ex- almost exactly what we're building now would be the class 3B or the class 1C. So, yeah, I, and and if they turn around and start saying that, oh, no, fire sprinklers are now mandatory and you have to retrofit, that's what I'm terrified of, right? Mm-hmm. I think that would be really what th- tough. What do you think it costs a retrofit fire sprinkler system? Um, look, I don't know. Gut feel. I, I honestly haven't asked anyone, but gut feel, it depends. What it would what would what it would depend on is how much of the ceilings you destroy and have to rebuild. Mm. So the, the sprinklers wouldn't... So you'd have to probably dig up the driveway to create the trenches and everything. Yeah. So maybe you had to do that. Because you need a, a bigger water connection into the house, yeah. don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest thing is the, the the cost to retrofit is not any different than the cost of installing. Hmm. The difference is now all the rework that you have to do as a result of that, right? Yeah. So if it's a very easy, straightforward house, lots of roof space, maybe it's not too bad. But if there's anything, anything about it, you've got timbers in the way then you know, it could cost 80, 100 grand mm. because you have to tear down ceilings and redo them and stuff like that. Mm. Do you think they'd be grandfathered for the ones that have already been registered with the SDA or do you think they could go back and say, we want them retrofitting all of them? Um, I don't know. Again, like... It's tricky it would, one, isn't it? it? Yeah, and it would, look, it would be super impractical. If, you have if to they, move people out of the house. Exactly. It'd yeah. be so impractical. Yeah. Um, having said that... Um, do do people and providers ask for sprinklers? Is that your experience? Do participants and providers, are they saying, oh, I only want a sprinklered house? We haven't come across it yet, but again, in the new pricing arrangement, there's, yeah. you know, you get, there's additional money there if you do install them. Yeah. So I think 
right now. See, they got the cost assumption for sprinklers right this time. If you read that, they realize that it's not a per square meter thing, it's a flat fee. So whether you have a slightly bigger house or a smaller house, it's like a unit cost. And they've added about 50 grand, which I think is pretty much on the money, mm -hmm. right? So um, what's guiding me is, I think there's commercially, it's sensible, because it's about 10 grand on a 50 grand investment. So that's not bad, 20% on that money. It's not bad. Um, and on top of that, some of the providers I'm working with are seeing it as a significant benefit mm. because they're worried that if they move people into a home that doesn't have sprinklers and then anything happens, that they have an exposure. Yeah. So um, the providers I'm working with are requesting it, so we just do it. Especially yeah. if they've got the head lease on the property as well. Like that yeah. then makes them responsible, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, what are we saying about insurance in this space? Have you managed to find any insurance providers mm. yet? No, I haven't. Um, yes, obviously, but they insure it like a normal dwelling. I don't mm. know anyone who's going to insure you for the SDA funding. Have you? We're, so the girl that we work with, Karen Tacken, she was on a podcast two or three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and they are, they are doing some in the SDA space, but they won't cover you for loss of rent for well, malicious SDA. damage in a HPS, but they will in an IEL. Um, and in robust, they won't do it either. But there's also some comp some complexities around the robust thing as well. So it's it's again, it's still quite new, and yep. they still haven't really worked it out. Yeah. Um, but it's, they have got providers out there, or underwriters out there that can. They're that starting can to. It. Are they underwriting the SDA income? Oh, I can't. I'd have to go back and listen to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've had a few well, conversations. I, well, I would, yeah, I'll jump onto that one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because from what I understand, is that no one is underwriting the SDA income. They'll underwrite the rental income, which is a small fraction of the income yeah. of the dwelling. See, they're, they're underwriting the HMO income, so yeah. I don't see yeah. why they wouldn't. But HMO income's all rent. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, S SDA income is not rent. It mm. is a medical support, uh, which is why it's GST free and why we get all these perks where we get to claim GST credits and all the rest of that, right? But it's um, because of that, it's, it's like you it's like you're offering, you have a business that does a service, um, they, they might cover the lease on the property, but not the lost income from your business. So, or maybe there's a business insurance. I don't know. But then again, <laughs> like it'll be expensive too, right? So, <laughs> Yeah, well, it's even more expensive when your $600,000 house burns down, isn't it? Yeah, and for sure. no cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. <laughs> insurance is too expensive not to have, yeah. yeah. Um, what else is happening in the space, mate? Is there anything that we haven't touched on that we, that we need to talk that about? We need to, um, look, I think that we are... We're, I think we're at a pretty good spot in WA. I feel mm. like, um, yes, there's a lot of demand and all the rest of that, but I really feel like the there is a lot of good people as well. I think a lot of the providers are starting to get quite savvy about it. I mm. think some of the SDA providers are putting together really great marketing now and, and have really great participant engagement strategies. I can't wait to see what you do when you start getting into this space. Yeah, we've, um, we've just been talking to someone about a BDM role. Yeah. Who's also yeah. just recently been on the podcast as yeah. well. So if we bring him on board, yep. um, yeah, it'll be, it's going to be a good space. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy. Like, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Look, I mean, our intention yeah. is to be here for 30 years, right? Yeah. So we're, we're trying to, yes, there's a little bit of a chaos storm and, you know, some people are trying to ride away and make a quick buck and do whatever. We're trying to ignore most of that and stay focused on the long game. Mm. And understand that this is this is a sector that's here to stay in some form. Um, yes, like with everything new, like Bitcoin, you know, people jump in, they make some good money. Everyone jumps in after that and lose a ton of money. <laughs> so there will be some of that in SDA. There will be a lot of blood on the street. So I think people have to be very careful. Mm. Um, but I think if you take a long term view, uh, I think that yeah, I think SDA is in a really good spot. Yeah, right? I agree, man. I agree, yeah. and it, it comes back to them fundamentals: get the right people. Yeah, build a good product, yeah. not the cheapest product, yeah. and don't aim for the highest return, aim for the best outcome of the people that live there. Yeah, which yeah. is you know when you compare that SDA to here tomorrow, it's the same, it's exactly the same outcome, isn't it? This is why I spoke to you about it when I. Um, I don't know if you remember that conversation. It must have been twenty what eighteen nineteen. Yeah. I guess. This is just before it rolled out in WA. Yeah. I said, Neil, I think hey, I think SDA is the biggest opportunity we'll see in our lifetime in real estate. He said, Nah, man, I think HMO is bigger. Right? <laughs> Do you remember this? I think the, I think the market's bigger. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And um, when, when we look at the amount of people yeah. out there, but I think the SDA opportunity. Uh, and not just the opportunity to make money, but the opportunity to do some good as yeah, well and deliver sure. a quality outcome. Because yeah. there's nothing better than, 
yeah, making money is good, but it gets boring after a bit if, if it's just like a hollow existence. Exactly. But if you see in the, the faces the, on the people like you're putting in this accommodation, and yeah. that, that changes everything, mate. Absolutely. It really helps you, you know, so for sure. I'm excited for where it's going. Yeah. I'm excited to finish these first few and see who we get in there and, yeah. you know, hopefully get down there and have a chat with them as well because yeah. uh, I'd love to find out more about them. Where, what the, where they've been living previously yeah uh, what it feels like moving into this brand new yeah that, and that's how house. we're going to learn bro yeah. that's how we're going to learn what's what's going on yeah. uh, and what people want and that's awesome what, what do you think about the SDA space overall where are you at with this um, look I, w- I was hesitant about it at first but it was only because I was so focused on HMO it, that's my that's my baby it's always been the core of the business and yeah. always will be yeah you know I think we're probably doing probably 65 70% HMO at the minute and 35 to 40% SDA, but that we're only doing that because there's been a lot of people contacting us about it, and we've I've probably done about seven or eight podcasts on it as well. Sure. Um, but I'm also conscious that, you know, there is a lot of supply coming through, so it won't be long before I kind of pull back on it again, and the HMO will be 90%, and SDA will only be mm-hmm. 10%. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm hoping with this BDM that we're bringing on board that that will open more doors for their robust areas as well, because... Like you say, it's an area that's kind of been not ignored, but it's just not getting the attention that it deserves and needs and needs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we want to be delivering more robust, but until we get the answers that we need, then you know, it's there's an element of risk there. Yeah. Um, but not enough risk for me to just walk away from it altogether. It's just more DD needed. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. The spec is hard as well. Yeah. Um, but we'll we'll go through that when you. Yeah, we'll show you what we're doing and we'll yeah. show you the specs and we'll show you the products. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, what I like about the, the community and like you said there, between the five or six of us that are yeah. out there doing this, so Andy Hagen's another one of these yeah. guys, a uh, good guy, yeah. big heart, really good friend of ours. Um, he's building a property up in the... Let's call it the Northwest. Yeah. And he took it. Have you been up there? And no, that? I haven't. Yeah. I haven't. I've got to hit him up though. So he invited yeah. us up there. And like, you'd think like... He's building X amount, we're building a certain amount, you're building a certain amount. Everyone would be like really secretive about what they're doing, but yeah. everybody's collaborating to yeah. try and get the best outcome for these people. So Andy yeah. took us up there and he showed us yeah. everything that went right, but also everything that went wrong on this yeah. property as well, because this was kind of like his flagship. He was a pioneer. Yeah. Yeah, he was a pioneer. Yeah. And thank, thanks to him, you know, we learned a lot. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And he's been very open about the things that have went right, went wrong, mm-hmm. what he'd change if he did it again, um, what he'd definitely do again. Um, but what Andy also did have is he's got a friend who's disabled and he, yeah. he got a, he did a lot of consultation with this guy as well. Yeah. Like, what would you want? What wouldn't you want? Yeah. And that's only one person, you know, we need that from like 500 people. Don't Absolutely. Me? So I Absolutely. think, I think we'll gather the data between us as a mm-hmm. group, mm-hmm. uh, which will then enable us to, to create better outcomes again. Yeah. It's exciting, man. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. And, and I think like, I think that approach will do well, even in the long term. Mm. I think the people that will struggle are the the mums and dads who have been sold a dream mm-hmm. um, without, you know, that, and that's that's who I think will suffer, yeah. which is a real shame. Well, you said, you said it in the kitchen. We were making a coffee just before we hit record, and you yeah. said something about collaboration. Yeah. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> you were like, that's what I like about you. You're always open to collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, and I just think, you know, there's... there's plenty out there for everybody like why try and hide it all yourself yeah, and, and just try and work it out yourself when you can bounce ideas off everybody else that's yeah, out there and we, and we all learn faster yeah. that way and the SDA conference is one of them things as well you know there's there's all of the developers there there's providers there's OTs there's all good drinks at the end of it as well yeah, that's always the best part isn't it? <laughs> yeah. but the SDA Latin conference is a good PM. place to go to you know meet other people that are in that space and find yeah. out what's working what's not so yeah I, I'm excited um, and cautious at the same time yeah. sort of thing because um, like you say the, the biggest risk is the tenancy yeah. and I don't feel like we've got enough data currently mm. but and I think the only bit that's lacking for me is the robust data at the minute Yeah, because sure. we're delivering HPS yeah. which kind of leaves us open to uh, IELTS and FAs as well Yeah, yeah. which I think um, is wise like, yeah, I think that's yeah. really good Yeah. awesome man what else are you excited about in the space anything else? In, in the SDA space or just generally? Uh, generally, like, uh, you know, we're getting the buzz back for construction again. Now we're oh, kind of definitely. coming through. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Right? yeah, It's an exciting space in construction. Like everything's always urgent and high stress, right? Mm. But it's also very rewarding when you when you when when the delivery's happening. When things are moving, it feels great. Um, and, you know, where we are at right now in the Perth property market cycle, I'm super optimistic. 
right? So we are Me just too. we are just in a in a. I think we're in a good spot. Right? Yeah. We're getting fun, like we're getting a lot of time in the sun. We're getting a lot of inquiry from the east, which is um, which I haven't heard of in a long time. You know, I've never seen it because I started my journey uh, in 2016 as the market started to taper off. So yeah. this is like. Like Tony Robbins says, like if you can build it in the winter, yes, the, the summer should be fine, you know. And I've only ever seen the winter; I've just seen a market that went yeah. down and down and down. So, same actually. It's interesting to see all this inquiry coming through, and then when you look at the stats and the data, I still believe we've got a long run ahead of us. It's just yeah. simple su- supply and demand. Yeah, at the minute. Yeah, um, and I, just, I think one thing that you said, which is also really good, is like you've got your HMO, you've got your HMO strategy that you've been refining through the winter and you've been doing well and you've gotten really, really good at it, right? And it's really great that you're not letting that go and you're continuing to nurture that. So our traditional developments are still the bread and butter of what we do. SDA, interestingly, is about 30% of what we do as well, yeah. you know? And um, and we've been a little bit... We don't want to let go of everything we built in the development space, but at the same time, we're also cautious about what happens if funding gets cut or this happens mm. it's very very high risk um this sda space so it's great if you manage it well and you can navigate through it and you i think everyone like everyone in our positions in the property game should be making a very serious uh you know take a serious bite of the cherry uh but if it's your only bite if it's your only cherry maybe it's a bit dangerous right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so spread the risk yeah spread yeah, the risk and, and maintain your capability right i think uh it's this it's all about what are you good at and how can you apply that to new problems? Mm. So we we were good at development, design, construct, all the rest of that, and that's what we've applied. You guys were really, really great at HMOs and property management and everything else, and that's what you're applying to your SDA Mm. uh, journey, right? Uh, But you could apply that to many different things. You could go back to traditional development. You could go to traditional property management. You could go to commercial property management. I don't know. There's like many things you could take a capability in property management and apply it to, Mm. uh, same way as design and construct, right? SDA is just one you know, one like f- thing that you can apply a design and construct solution to. Yeah, yeah. So really focusing on getting good at that thing and staying good at it, I think is is what the winter has taught us, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's been good. I, I think, you know, it, it's difficult because we haven't got the inquiry that we do have now. Yeah. But it's also it gives you it gives you the time and the patience to, yeah. to work it out yeah. without the pressure at yeah. the same time, sort of thing. So, yeah, it's been an interesting journey, man. What we haven't spoke about today is uh, Perth Property Developers because you are the co-founder yes. of PPD. Yes, so yes, yes. So what am I do, mate? Because, man, we're cracking on 56, you know what I mean? That, that hour has flown it's by, hasn't it? It's gone, yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do, mate, I'm going to invite you and Adam back on the podcast and we'll talk about Perth Property Developers and we'll talk Love about to, development in Perth in general because... Let's because um, you've got some cool projects on the go at the minute, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's the um, Mount Lawley one going on? Yeah, coming up, man. I think the roof should be on any any day now, really, yeah. just waiting that bloody rain to stop. Yeah. Um, this, there's a very strange market at the moment because we don't know. I feel like there's a lot of uh, interest rates are obviously a lot higher, so that affects mm. a few things in how we view projects. Um, but there's an enormous, enormous arbitrage in high-end renovations that we're seeing. So our more recent projects have been uh, like inner city, you know, buy a million dollar house, dilapidated million dollar house, and they sell for around one point eight million renovated, and um, and people are really struggling to deliver those projects. But having a design and construct capability, that's bread and butter. Yeah. Right. So we're seeing that the demand that we're seeing at that price point is enormous, uh, and the resistance and the reluctance that everyone's having to actually jump in and do any construction is probably serving us very well yeah so lots of opportunities at the moment mate so, so when you but when you say renovation we're not just talking about like a bit of new carpet there are no we? it's, a, it's talking, a structural renovation yeah, yeah. renovation probably costs 300 400 k something yeah like so in for a mill 400k extension reno yeah. which is what mate a 300k reno we were building houses for that yeah, three years ago reno. weren't we yeah yeah mate <laughs> oh my good we built the those hmos yeah that was 300 right 400. 400. Yeah, eight. just 400, yeah. Crazy. Unbelievable. Right? That's a double story. Yeah. It's like 200 and something square they're like, meters. They're coming in at high sixes now. Same Unbelievable, goal. man. Crazy, isn't just it? Just like that as well. Yeah. So before everyone runs out and tries to look at these high end renovations where yeah. you're going to make 800 grand, you're, yeah. you're still making like three, 400 yeah, grand. It mind, would, yeah. yeah, it'll be more like that. Yeah. Uh, but it's quick and it's straightforward and there's no council approval. Well, there's some council approvals, but much easier than 
trying to do three houses. Mm. The new R codes is obviously a big challenge as well, so that needs to be navigated. We'll talk about that um, when we bring Adam in as yeah. well. Awesome, man. I got, thank you very much for your time, Pleasure, brother. Man. See you again. Pleasure. Ciao, brother. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Make sure you tune in the same time next week so you stay up to date with all the cash flow positive property updates.